Creekers here today. So glad you all are here and everyone else as well too. Welcome to uh, Grace Fellowship and welcome to all those watching live on Facebook. We appreciate you watching. I just have uh, one announcement that I know of and that's Pastor Mike wants to meet with all those that's involved in the Hope venue. Like I said last week, if you don't know who you are, you are those that's on the praise team, audio visual, um, offerings, if you take up offerings, if you give offerings, if you do communion, anything that has to do with the uh, stuff that goes on during our worship service. So just a quick meeting, maybe about 15 minutes after church. Um, and also, if you have a prayer request, remember there are prayer request cards in the seat back, as well as envelopes for you to put your offering in. And I think Miss Pat has the offering today. So if you will stand, we're going to get started by singing a, a, a song. Hopefully it will get your blood a, blood a going and your feet a moving and, and whatever. <laughs> we're going to praise our Lord and Savior today. Blessed be his name. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name.
God inhabits your praise. So when we come here and praise him, he is here in the midst. Amen. All right, Miss Pat's going to come up and uh, lead us in the offering. Good morning. It's a beautiful day to come out and worship our Lord. Of course, today is Mission Sunday. And Christine's already told you about the prayer request and all that, so I won't repeat that. But all the bills and loose change in the offering today goes to missions. <clears throat> this week... I took all the pop caps. Well, I didn't take all because there's still some in the car, one in my pocket. <laughs> but I had a big bag. It was really heavy. It was about that big. <laughs> and uh, the girl, it was a different woman in there this time. And she was uh, sitting at the computer putting in those numbers. And she looked at that bag, and I, I don't think she realized what I had. And I told her, and she said that would take months to get put in the computer. But she said that bag would provide a lot of funds for activities at Mountain Mission School. She was tickled to death. And you know, that doesn't cost us any money except for that bottle of pop we drank. And it's, so just keep saving all your pop caps. And uh, our friends at the Bengali Eva, Janelle, Eva, Evangel Associate Ministry sends a letter out, I think about once a month. And this one, uh, says that one of the GOAT recipients said, I was financially and spiritually bankrupt. Your gift of a GOAT gave me hope to continue my life. Now I feel I'm a valuable member of my community. And this person had received a GOAT a couple of years before. And a GOAT gives four quarts of fresh milk every day, and they usually produce twins, which they can sell those or, you know, they can use those for meat or whatever, or they can let it grow up and give more milk that they probably could sell. So what a difference a goat made. It opened a door called Hope and carried a powerful message of God's love, all because someone in a land far away cared. And that one goat costs $45. Now, some other places have a goat program, but they're much more expensive than this one. Le Leviticus 19.10 says, Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord, your God. Okay. The self-help goat program has helped more than 1,000 families in Bangladesh Go ahead. to live a life of dignity and reach their potential. So that's, part, that's one of our missions is the BEA program in Bangladesh. And you know, some people would say, well, what do you want to do that, send that all the way? That's a long ways off. You know, uh, some people don't want to help somebody in another country, because I've got a friend like that. Her daughter called her and wanted some information on Mountain Mission. She said, no, they got all these black 
kids there and, and they claim that they're diplomats kids. They're not. They are from Africa or foreign countries, but they're not uh, diplomats children that come there free. You remember when those kid girls were kidnapped a few years ago and seven of those girls escaped? They're at Mountain Mission right now. I, I think that's great. They got to Washington, D.C. Somebody up there knew about Mountain Mission, so that's where they are. Father in heaven, thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us to come out and worship you. And I pray you bless Debbie as she does the sermon. And Father, thank you for this offering, this money for missions. And I just pray that we'll use the money wisely. And it'll all be used for your glory and your honor. And Father, bless those that gave and those that don't have it to give. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, definitely mission work is a big part of Grace Fellowship, and we do appreciate everyone who, who gave, who didn't go over their vineyard a second time like Pat said, but they, uh, instead of putting those coins in a piggy bank, they brought it and put them in the offering plate this morning. So we appreciate everything that you all do because the Lord says what you do for the least of these you've done to me so if you'll stand we're going to sing about the goodness of God and let me tell you he is good I love you Lord for your mercy never failed me and all my days i've been held in your hands from the moment that i wake up until i lay my head oh i will sing of the goodness of god the goodness of God. 
deep and faithful to you. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. ago that the Lord inhabits our praises. So we're going to raise a hallelujah today because God is good. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. to fight for me.
the middle of this storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the King is alive. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the King is alive. I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. That's where he fights your battles. Raise a hallelujah. You've got something that's got a hold of you. Leave it here today. Let God handle that. His hope is alive in him. And death is defeated in him. So we're going to praise a hallelujah. I raise a Father in heaven, our almighty God, our creator, our sustainer, our redeemer, our friend. We just praise you in this place today. And we know, God, that you are in control. We know, God, that you are the one that makes the darkness flee. We know that in you, darkness can't be found. And we know, Father, that our hope and our salvation comes from you. So we praise you today in this place, God. And I pray, Lord, that you would just bless Pastor Debbie as she comes forward and gives us your word. I pray, Lord, that we would hear the message and that it would not grow stagnant within us, but that we would raise a hallelujah, Lord, that whatever you have for us, God, that we would surrender our lives to you. We would step out in faith and we would do what you have called us to do. So we offer our praise to you, God, today in this place. Bless us, cover us, Lord, and just be with us. We love you, God. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. After that, you just want to say hallelujah, don't you? Like, I feel like, how am I going to follow that? Really, really beautiful. Beautiful. Well, good morning to everyone. Glad you're here today. Good to see you. Really, really good to see you here today, Tony. <laughs> We're raising a hallelujah for you. So, Amen. I'd like to say good morning to everyone who may be watching or will be watching later on Facebook or YouTube. We appreciate you joining with us and being a part of our service. It's always uh, encouraging to uh, 
know that others are watching and it's even more encouraging when we have comments or responses so feel free anytime and if you have any kind of prayer request any kind of news you want to share with us we consider you our family whether you're here in person or watching you're still part of our family and we are glad that you have joined us today so thank you how many people here are spider-man fans <laughs> Um, not the Tobey Maguire. Oh well. <laughs> well, how many of you seen the release of the new Spider-Man movie, No Way Home? I haven't got to see it yet. Okay. You like it? Okay. Well, very good. Well, it was a gutsy gamble when this new Spider-Man movie was released, No Way Home. But it seems to have paid off at the box office. Because what they did was they took versions from the previous movies and brought those in and kind of tied them all together in this neat bow. And each version of the Spider-Man movie, it had the same backstory. Peter Parker suddenly has this superhuman strength, this great ability and power. He's newly empowered, but he fails to stop a criminal when he has the chance, only to have that same criminal end up killing his uncle and his mentor. And with his dying breath, the uncle leaves him with one of the most memorable superhero mottos of all time. With great power comes great responsibility. And that motivates Peter Parker. And he decides that he is going to live in honor of that statement. He is determined that he is not going to squander the gifts that he has been given. That's the kind of thing that can inspire any of us. We hear a quote like that and it motivates us and it inspires us. And we think, I want to do that too. I want to use whatever ability I have. I want to do good and it's a, it's a motivation and an inspiration. But then you may have others that breathe a sigh of relief and say, thank you, God, that I don't have any kind of power. <laughs> so you have both ends of the spectrum there. <laughs> well, none of us here today may have great power. But if we are a Christian, we do have great responsibility. And these... And that's a truth that you'll see repeated again and again in Scripture. And it's going to be found in our passage today. And I apologize, Bobby had volunteered to read, but I didn't get the microphone. So we'll do it another time, okay, Bobby? <laughs> but our passage today starts in Luke 16, starting in verse 1. He also said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager. And charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and he said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. Verse 3. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do? Since my master is taking the management away from me, I'm not strong enough to dig. And I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do. So that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors, one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. He said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, How much do you owe? And he said, well, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, well, take your bill and write 80. Then the master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that it, when, when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. Verse 10. 
One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. Very important point, isn't it? Very important point. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you to the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Probably out of that whole passage, that's what stands out for all of us, isn't it? You cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve God, and you cannot serve money. That we're familiar with, that we've heard. Well, anytime you read a parable, the point of the parable is you, you read into it, and you determine, who are you in this parable? You know, what person are you? And it doesn't take long if you read through this parable that you realize that we are supposed to be the shrewd <laughs> manager of the money. So a parable doesn't exactly line up with life, but they do have good moral stories. Uh, you know, it would be nice if you could read one that just lined up with your life perfectly, but we take from it what how it fits and applies and how we identify in our lives. But it does express godly concepts, practical points that we are to follow in our lives. And when you have parables that are given in a series, then you know, there, there's a truth that's being woven through that series of parables to form Jesus' message. So each parable has its own story, a truth in it. But when you put them all together, then you begin to see what Jesus' message is that he's trying to give us. And so we have read this before. I think I've read it. I think Mike has read it as well. That the, primarily the message in these parables was aimed toward the Pharisees because you know, they were there and they were listening and they were condemning, Right? We see in Luke 15, 1, 2. I think you read this last week, didn't you, Mike? It says, Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So wherever he is, they're on his back. <laughs> they're listening and they're watching. And they are judging and they are condemning his actions. So doesn't that, have you been in a situation where somebody's talking about a situation, but you know they really are aiming that at you? <laughs> well, that's, that's this kind of situation. He's telling the parables. They're hearing, and they know he is really saying, giving a message to them. And they do not, they do not like it at all. So what we see in the message of the parables that, again, that there's lessons that are to be taught. And so we're going to go through just a couple. I'm not going to read the scriptures that Mike read last week. But he talk, talked about, do you remember what he, the two things that he talked about? I'm going to give you a test. The lost sheep. <laughs> and the, the, you get an A plus, Ron. <laughs> and the lost coin. <laughs> So to give us hope, right? It's a message of hope for people that's gone astray. And the parables, that are, these parables were in particular, were to be understood as uh, God going to bring someone back. He is bringing sinners back into a relationship with him. And I think a really important point that was made last week was that the shepherd was looking for the sheep. And the woman was looking for the lost coin. But neither the sheep nor the coin knew they were lost. Neither knew they were lost. They weren't looking to be found. They weren't expecting to be found. Isn't that how people are that don't know God? They're not looking for God. They don't know that they're lost. 
They don't know that they need to be found. But God pursues us until we are found. And then the return is cause for great rejoicing. That was, that's in the first part of Luke 15. So this is leading up. Luke 15 leads up to, to the passage that I read in Luke 16. So that's the first part. It was about the coin and the sheep. The last part of Luke 15 is the parable of the prodigal son. And most of us are very familiar with the prodigal son that won his inheritance. And he takes it and he, squand he squandered the gift of his inheritance away. And remember, he squandered it to the point that he was working <laughs> uh, in a pig pen. And when he got to the point that he looked at the pig's food and he saw that he wanted to eat it, it was, that was that moment of realization for him of just how much he had squandered the gift that his father had given to him. And he had that aha moment. And so he returned to his father. So in this case... We have the son going back to the father. And, and what's the father doing? He's watching for him. He prepares a feast for him. He is rejoicing. But not only does the father rejoice that his lost son is now found. The father willingly forgives him for squandering his inheritance. He willingly forgives him. The question that we don't have an answer to in the parable is, what about the older brother? The older brother is envious because the father forgave the younger son. So we don't know if the, younger, if the older brother, does he walk away? Does he re renew his relationship with the father? Does he allow his pride and his anger to continue to overrule him in his life? We don't know the answer to that question, so that one is left. But the point that Jesus was making was what has been lost is found, cause of rejoicing. So we see this theme going through Luke 15. So in the text that we read today, that the shrewd manager kind of continues that theme of being redeemed. You know, Mike did a really good job in his sermon last week explaining how God pursues us, how he forgives us, and how when we are reconciled, you know, it is a cause for great rejoicing. And we find ourselves there. When, when, when we're found, then we have this aha moment. We realize that maybe what our life has been, you know, like, like the son that found himself in the pig pen, we, we realize just where we are. You know, what has gone in our life, what, what, how have we lived, the decisions that we've made, how we've spent, spent, every, you know, spent our time, whatever it is. We have that crisis or maybe that crossroads, whatever you want to call it, and we realize what has gone before of this moment. And then it prompts the question, what do we do now? So in this parable, in the previous parable, Jesus was speaking more to the Pharisees. In this parable, he is speaking more to his disciples because we read in 16.1, he also said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager and charges were brought against him that this man was wasting his possession. So now this parable is directed more toward the disciples. So Jesus... Well, he's, he's wanting to make the point to the disciples that if they're following him, they're to follow his example of generosity. He is, he, and that's the, that's the message that we're to get as well, that Jesus is generous with us. He's generous in, in the, when he redeems our lives. He is he's generous in forgiving our sins. He's very generous with us. And what do we do with the generosity that's been given to us? Yeah, that... That's where we have to make a decision of what we're going to do from that point on. So Jesus' conclusion then at the end, like we said, is that one statement that we all know, that we remember all the time, that you cannot serve God and cannot serve money at the same time. You either hate one and despise the other, whatever, love one, hate one. You can't, you can't, do, can't do them equally. 
they're always going to be out of balance. You can't do them both equally at the same time. And the point that he makes is that, um, that living contrary to God isn't just in the choices that we make. It may not just be in the, uh, the, maybe the questionable job practices that we have or in our sinful acts, but it's also in how we spend our money, our pursuit of wealth, maybe our pursuit of influence. And I want to read just because I really liked what this said in the study Bible regarding that verse. It, as, it asks the questions. Look, when we, when we get to that point in our life, we, then we ask, our, then we ask um, get my, here's how you can determine where you are on that scale. How often do you think about money or worry about money? Do you give up doing things that you would like to do in the pursuit of trying to make money? Do you spend a lot of time caring for your possessions? Is it hard to give away money? Are you in debt because of trying to have more money? So these are questions that we ask ourselves. I, I, like, I like those questions because it's thought-provoking. You now, we have to assess you know, where we are in our lives. We have to be honest, <laughs> answer honestly where we are. Where, where does it rank? You know, like I said, it's never going to be even. So h- how far out of balance is it? You know, is it a little out of balance or is it like this? How out of balance is it? in our lives. So the Pharisees, I mean, they, I mean, obviously they hated Jesus. Because they knew that through these passages that he has been condemning them. He's been condemning their actions. And because they're, you know, they're concerned about him spending time with sinners, right? With sinful people. And they couldn't understand and this is really important. They couldn't understand that his relationship with the sinner was more important to him than condemning the sin. And it was so important, Ron, that he sent his son. You know, it's coming. Sent his son to <laughs> in order to remove the condemnation. If I had a microphone for you, Ron... <laughs> Maybe you want to repeat this with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Amen. John three sixteen. What do we focus on? What do a lot of people focus on? We focus on the sin. We focus more on the actions. What we don't know is the state of somebody's heart, do we? We don't know. But Jesus was focused on his relationship with questionable people (laughs) for the Pharisees. He was more concerned about the state of their heart, their relationship with him, than he was about condemning their sin. Now, in the passage, the shrewd manager is not a person that you think should be idolized celebrated, but yet he's presented as the hero in this story. He's cheated, he's swindled, and it's only at the last moment when he, when he has the certainty of unemployment and disaster upon him <laughs> that he changes his ways. Like he's got to do something, right? Um, but yet the correct shrewd manager, the corrupt shrewd manager, he is set up for making the correct choices for the simple reason that he's concerned about his future. So the ma- and then the master con- commended him, the dishonest manager, for his shrewdness. And we just read back earlier in Luke 16 that the sons of the world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of the light. And so what happens sometimes is you have people who are dishonest and they work harder for selfish reasons, selfish causes, selfish motivation, they work harder than those of us that are the children of light who have been given the gift of, of, of salvation than we do to make a difference in the world or to help 
right? They work harder. They're more shrewd. We're, you know, we're sometimes, we're just very passive. You know, hey, I'm, a, I'm saved. I'm, a, I'm, I'm secure in my salvation. So let me just live my life, you know, and I won't worry about anything or anybody else. But you have somebody that's dishonest for selfish gain, selfish motivation, selfish reasons. Like they work harder, much harder. If anybody should be working harder, who should it be? Should be us, right? We should be the ones that are commended. <laughs> um, so Jesus is telling his disciples, those who want to follow him need to change their perspective. They need to look heavenly, heavenward and keep their eyes on the eternal prize in Jesus. I mean, many choices we come face to face with throughout our lives. They're going to have two outcomes. They're either going to build earthly wealth and influence, or they're going to build true riches in heaven. So that's where we have to check our motives. When we do something, like, are we wanting recognition for it? Are we wanting praise for it? Are we wanting everybody to know everything that we do? Or do we just go about doing things because we're building up treasures in heaven because we're not just focused on the here and the now. So we have to check our motives. Even when we do something for somebody here and now, you know, what's our motivation in doing it? Is it because it's the right thing? Because our heart is to want to help and serve and to do? Or is it because we want somebody to know what we've done? We have to check our motives. I mean, all of our sins are forgiven with the high cost <laughs> of grace, of what it cost Jesus Christ through his death, burial, and resurrection. We need to make sure that we are not, that we are appreciative of that, and we are not focused on gaining possessions, and that our focus is on status and on wealth. Because if we, it's not wrong to have money. We, we even had this uh, quote, I think William had this quote in Bible study Wednesday, right? You know, money is not the root of all evil. It's the love of money that's the root of it, all evil. It's not wrong to have money. Nothing's wrong. It's not at all wrong. But what do we do with the money that we have? And if we spend it for selfish gain, selfish reasons, selfish, for status recognition, it makes us very vulnerable to sin. So in the story of the parable, there's a, there's a freeing truth in there. Because we possess nothing. Did, did the, did the uh, corrupt manager, did he possess anything? No, he didn't, because it was the rich man's <laughs> goods, right? The, the, the manager himself, he didn't own anything. It was the rich man's possessions that he was in charge of, so he owned nothing. And so we owned nothing, too. Everything that we have, our wealth, our health, our skills, our ability, our potential, anything that we have is a gift from Almighty God. We have no power on our own. But the question is, what do we do with the gifts that we have been given? Do we use them for God's glory? Do we use them to help others? Do we use them to serve? Or do we just squander them away in selfish, riotous living? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. Then the manager, after the gig is up, and he's called on the carpet by the rich man, he has this internal conversation with himself when he takes stock of his pretty desperate situation. He's fired. He's either too weak or he's too lazy to work, and he's too proud to beg. So he schemes of what he might do. So he's not turned in the ledgers yet which means he can still make some transactions. Nobody knows that he's fired yet. He's just gotten the word from the boss, but he's not cleaned out his belongings yet. So he still has the books. But then he thinks, what can he do? So then he thinks of a plan that will 
put him in the good graces of the debtors. So that when he has to clean out <laughs> his belongings and leave, he's cut all these people a deal. So surely somebody will be grateful for the money that he saved and will take him in and give him a job. So he's pretty shrewd. He's pretty smart. Right? It's all for selfish motivation and selfish reason. But he worked really hard to come up with this plan and execute this plan. And even though it was a, that, he, that he was dishonest in the things he did, the rich man still commanded him for, 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 what, for his actions. So again, if this man works this hard for an unjust cause, unjust reason for selfish gain, how much more should we as children of light use the gifts that God has given to us? And we find, you know, we find ourselves in moments like the shrewd manager. It hits us of what God has done for us. How he has forgiven us. How he has redeemed us. How he has found us. And then what do we do? What is our next step? How do we then live in appreciation for the gifts that we have been given by God? And that's the, and that's the question that each of us at some point in time has to ask ourselves. And you notice that the, the manager, the, the decision that he made wasn't in that mo helping him in the moment because he didn't gain any money from the transactions with the, with the debtors. But what he was doing was for his future. He's thinking, when I have to leave employment here, when I have to clean out and get out, you know, somebody here that I've cut a deal with is going to take me in. So he was thinking about his future, right? What's going to happen? This job is over. I'm going to, you know, I don't, we don't know how old he is. He's probably got many years left to live. So he's thinking about his future. And that's the point that the, Jesus is making to the disciples and it's making to us too. That as Christians, we're not just focused on the here and the now. But the decisions that we make are, are for eternity. How does everything that we do here how we spend our money, how we spend our time, everything that we do, how does that fit in eternity? Right? We don't just focus on, on now, the life here. Then our responsibility is to seek guidance through our relationship. Lord, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to live? We want God's generous heart to be our guide in the things that we do and how we spend our time, how we spend our money, what we do with the abilities that we have. We want God to be the guiding force. We want, the, we want it to be at the response, the motivation of the Holy Spirit, not just because we're wanting to be recognized or we want to be applauded or patted on the back. We want God to be the guiding force in our life because we're not focused on the here and now. I think uh, one of the versions of scripture calls this aliens and strangers. That's how we are. You know, this is not our eternal home. We're just aliens and strangers for a period of time on this earth. And then we're going to our eternal home in heaven with Jesus Christ. So what do we do with our time, our money, our abilities? You know, we need to think how what we do, how our actions fit into eternity. And that was the point that he was trying to make with his disciples. You know, life is not about accumulating wealth. But we want to make sure that what we have, we use it properly. It's looking beyond ourselves to the kingdom of God. You know, when we read through scripture, we learn from the teachings that in the kingdom, nobody's hungry, are there? Nobody's homeless. Nobody's suffering. Nobody's sad. There's no war. There's no greed. There's no cruelty. Everybody is welcome. Everybody is included in the kingdom of God. There's eternal compassion, forgiveness, and mercy. And most important, there is joy in the kingdom of God. And so our work as a Christian then is how do we use our money? How do we use our time? How do we use our knowledge? How do we use our gifts to bring the kingdom of God closer to this earth? 
when people see us, they should see Jesus. They should see that compassion and that mercy and that kindness. They shouldn't see harshness and judgment and selfishness and somebody trying to climb over top of somebody else's back for recognition or arguing about who's going to get the most attention out of something or the most benefit out of something. So our responsibility is to take what we've been given and put it toward our eternal purpose. A life lived with God in eternity, but now <laughs> with one another. And so when we do that, we will have been faithful with the unrighteous wealth. Because money is again. Money is not evil. But the greed of money. Is evil. That puts things into perspective. And when we do that. We'll gain the true riches. Which is our riches. In eternity with Jesus Christ. As children of light. We need to trust more. Than our bank account. We need to use our money for God's purposes and to benefit his people. Not just his people, benefit other people. Because everybody is God's child, whether they realize it or not. They've just not accepted that he died for them. Nobody was left out when, when Jesus died and was resurrected. There was nobody that was left out. But they don't know it. Everybody doesn't know it. They haven't accepted it. And they are lost. But they don't know that they're lost. Right? But we know. We know. And what is our responsibility? So the problem that we have, though, is that we're, we're between two worlds, right? <laughs> we, live, we live here in this world and we deal with here, but, but our heart is in our eternal home in heaven. And so the, how we live here what we're gaining toward is when this earth is over, then there's no more money, like all that's going to pass away. But eternity will never pass away. So if people who are crooked go to so much effort, like this shrewd manager, to be wicked, to be dishonest, and to cheat, and to be selfish... Why can't we, as his disciples, put even more effort into being his followers and being the sons and the daughters of light? We should be the hardest working. We should be the most enthusiastic, the most generous. Because verse 13 says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So what do we do with the gifts that we've been given? What we do with them indicates the state of our heart. It's not about how much you have. It's about how you use what you have. So how are you using the gifts that God has given to you? It's a question each of us has to answer for ourselves. How are you using the gifts that God has given to you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. A gracious and loving Father in heaven, we come before your throne again. So thankful, Lord, for your death, burial, and resurrection in Jesus Christ that guarantees our eternal home in heaven with you. But I pray, Lord, that as we live in this world, help us to be the children of light that you've called us to be. Help us to be aware of how we spend our time, how we spend our money, how 
how, the, how we spend our efforts to serve and to help others. Help us to be other-focused and not selfish and self-centered. Help us to think in terms of the things that we do and of how that fits into all eternity when we live in our eternal home with you. Because that's, that's why we live every day of our lives. That's what our focus should be. That's our motivation. That's our hope. Because without that, then we don't have anything to look forward to in this life. All we have is the, how we spend the, our time and, and the recognition. Because that is, that's the benefit that we reap. But when we have hope that our home is in eternity with you, Lord, that puts it into perspective. And we don't get so caught up into those things. And I pray that you would help us, Lord. You know where each of us are. You know our struggles. You know our difficulties. You know our challenges. You know our hopes. You know our needs, Lord. And I pray that we would just be open to you to allow your Holy Spirit to guide us and direct our steps and help us become the children of light that, that um, shines Jesus Christ to every person that we come into contact with. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for your grace and your mercy as always. And I ask all these things in Jesus' most holy and righteous name. Amen. Appreciate everyone being here today. Thank you for joining us on Facebook or YouTube. And hopefully one of these days you'll come and join us in person. We would really like that. Thank you.